Welcome to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. My name is Chris Troiano, joined always by Stephen Canis Tracy. Hello, everybody. This is episode number 14, where we'll be interviewing David Goins from the Saxton's Cornet Band. Earlier this week, it being June 2020, the Saxton's Cornet Band released a video updating their mission statement to include inclusivity, uh, especially in response to a lot of what's going on in the country at the moment. So it's a very thought forward uh that's not the right way of saying it forward it's thinking a, yeah it's a very forward thinking uh video and statement that they released that you know we wanted to get david on here as soon as possible to talk about so we're excited to to bring this perspective to the show yeah yeah definitely and i think it's um similar conversations are going to have to happen uh all across the country obviously in a lot of different places um and this is one of many that that will happen, I'm sure. And it was great to talk to David and kind of get um, just get more information and more perspective about uh, about what's going on and how it applies to um, 19th century brass band um, performance. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was great to talk to him and we really appreciate him taking the time uh, to come out and talk with us. Something, especially with this episode, we would love to hear your feedback and hear your thoughts on this topic. Uh, so it would be great to to have this discussion and be able to talk it out with our listeners, with you guys. So feel free to send us an email of what you guys think and be happy to, to hear from you and talk to you about this topic. Uh, Stephen, where can they email us? Uh, they can email us at eabb.podcast at gmail.com. I may or may not have forgotten the dot in a few previous episodes, so I'm sorry if anyone emailed uh what I said and it kicked back to him, but it's E A B B dot podcast at gmail.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, you can find us there as well. Cool. Enjoy episode number 14 with David Goins from Saxton's Cornet Band. Thank you so much, David Goins for coming onto the podcast this afternoon, logging onto zoom and speaking with us. We really appreciate it and appreciate your time coming out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, can we maybe uh, go a little bit chronologically here before we get into the, the meat of the episode? And would you mind maybe giving us a little bit of background on yourself, maybe some musical background and where you're coming from? Sure. Um, I'm a trumpet player by trade uh, from Frankfort, Kentucky originally, and I've lived here pretty much all my life, which is the capital of Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And um, did not grow up necessarily in a, uh, in a very musical family. Uh, my mom and dad sing in church and that's about it but i did have a brother uh, early on who's seven years older than i who he was going he was a tuba player in high school he was in a very good high school band and as he was entering the ohio state university he was joining the marching band there and a big brass band i was then that very year joining the sixth grade band and so i wanted to be just like him and um, I remember having a conversation he was a tuba player and he said uh I said, man, I really want to play the tuba. And he said, no, you don't. You don't play the trumpet. You'll get more gigs. <laughs> That's true. That's Verbatim. True. Yeah. So I did. Yeah. And uh, best decision ever. Yeah, good thing you didn't pick up euphonium. <laughs> yeah, no joke. <laughs> no joke. Yeah, we, we, we get a pass. We can say yeah. it. But. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so anyway, and I grew up in a, and I had a great high school band, a couple of really good band directors. And then, uh, out of high school was a going planned on attending uh, Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, and unfortunately, my senior in high school, my father died. So, wound up staying close to home, University of Kentucky. They have a great trumpet teacher there at the time, Vince DiMartino. Um, so, I started in my college uh, career there. The grass was greener, unfortunately. So, I thought. So, my sophomore year, I moved up to CCM because that's where I was initially going. Yeah, gotcha. loved it there. Studied with Alan Siebert played in the big band, played in all the ensembles. Awesome. Uh, underwent a heinous uh, embouchure change, which was pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, but after 
few months there, my father, who passed away, was a fireman, and uh, the state of Kentucky passed a law that basically allowed me to go to school anywhere in Kentucky for free mm-hmm. until I was 23. So my mother asked, can you please come back and go to school? So anyway, yeah, I finished yeah, anyway. up at my, my undergrad um, bachelor's degree in music education at UK, and I had great trumpet teachers while I was there. They're fantastic. Um, awesome. And a great, good musical school. And that's where, and we'll come back to this, where I hooked up with sax and cornet band. Awesome. Uh, but while you were going through the degree, were you bouncing between different styles? Or you mentioned you played in the big band. Were you more of like a jazzer kind of going through? No, no, I was not. I mean, I, I played lead in the big band, but um, I was, I really found my heart in a brass quintet that oh, yeah. uh, formed at the University of Kentucky. And that's where I really, um, really learned how to play and got through the embouchure change correctly and made some lasting friendships and things like that. Really learned how to, how to be a, a performer was through that, which fit right hand in hand with saxons. They kind of happened together. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so. I know Stephen and I kind of have similar uh, experiences. I know that we can both attest to brass chamber playing as kind of being like one of the most rewarding and one of the most, uh, most fruitful learning experiences, you know, that I know both of us kind of had in different situations, but absolutely. Yeah. 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 You really, I mean, you can't hide. So, you know, you got, no. <laughs> you no. got to play. And then like you, that combined with hopefully, you know, a good group and good relationships with the other people in the chamber group really, I think is for me, at least that was, that was really kind of, I think what drove my development in like undergrad and even my master's degree, I played in a lot of chamber stuff. Chamber music is always going to be my, you know, sticking point like i will force all my students to do it no matter what i think i think every <laughs> every successful musician has always had a chamber experience that really and that's where you make the personal connections the musical connections that's where you learn how you play that's where you learn how to react and that's where i think you also learn how to really dig into what maybe the composer was looking for mm-hmm. right and then you mentioned that that in kentucky you were able to hook up with the saxon's cornet band once you yeah. were there can, can you kind of talk about how how that meeting or that exposure kind of took place? Well, the tuba player in my brass quintet was playing with this Civil War band, which I didn't know a Civil War band from a polka band from anything else. <laughs> I had no idea. But they were rehearsing at the University of Kentucky, and that's kind of where they were based. And so, uh, you know, he just said, hey, I've got a gig. You want to play a gig? I'm sure. Okay. What's so that? Were they using just the facilities at the university? Or they were was just it... using the facilities. Yeah. So that... it wasn't like students or teachers or anything like that? No, no. But it, there were many people who were playing in the band who were students. So the person who sense. was running the band was getting her PhD on this very topic. So... On, uh, on Civil War brass bands? Correct. Very cool. Very cool. I know yeah. that you guys, yeah, there's doing my own research on it. I'm going through a bunch of different dissertations and stuff. And there's a fair number of uh, people going through the University of Kentucky that that use this as their topic. It's kind of one of the, I guess we can call the powerhouses of the, the research of institutions doing this type of research. So your tuba player friend in your quintet uh, was playing in this group. So he just, you know, asked you. Uh, yeah. 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 He just started playing with them. When, when was that about? Uh, believe it or not, it was on a recording session. They needed somebody to fill in on third alto. I didn't know an alto horn from whatever. I, I, what's that? Yeah. Literally sight reading on a recording session in a concert hall with an over the shoulder alto horn. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so how, how did that feel playing, being thrown into the fire <laughs> yeah, playing right. on an instrument like that? <laughs> I thought it was, yeah. I thought it was exciting. So little did I know that playing bop, 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 you know, would lead to this. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure it was probably a lot of, uh, what, like a, an ear exercise kind of more than it anything, was right? yeah like yeah, that's yeah. a lot lower than that <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> and hearing the pitch probably at a different frequency and, and all that kind bit, of stuff yeah. on the fly yeah yeah, yeah. That, you know believe it or not that actually has not ever really bothered me too much uh, oh yeah I, I, if i had perfect pitch it probably would but you, you settle in I, yeah, I guess if you're playing based on feel you just kind of play where the instrument feels right and right. that's in tune for the instrument right? right so after that recording session was that then you you kind of well, they became a regular. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, they basically had a job come up and they said, hey, you know, they knew I was a trumpet player and I, I played um, B flat cornet on it. Actually, the very first job was in St. Louis. And so um, they had a regular, uh, that was actually the first of about 10 years worth of regular jobs playing for the National Park Service at the um, old, old courthouse, which is basically what the arch is. It's part of the same property. The oh, arch okay. it encompasses. It picture it frames the old courthouse, which is where the Dred Scott case was tried, and it's part of the same oh, property. 
So oh, we played good. there for about 10 years on July 4th. They had a, they have a thing called the VP fair every July 4th. It's about four days and they will literally be a million people. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, they'll be, they'll have an enormous concert stage set up underneath the, the arch. And then we played historic concerts for a day in the, in the rotunda. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's my first job. They said, can you come play? And it pays a little money. And so yeah. there yeah, you go. Not, not bad. Not bad. When, about what year was it that you kind of started playing in with these guys? 1992. 92. Awesome. So right. the band formed, I think, what was it? In 1989. 1989. So yep. Do you know uh, kind of any of the history of the, the forming <laughs> yeah. of that group? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. And it's funny. Um, so you have, let's, let's back up a little bit. In the yep. early 80s, you have a Civil War musician historian, Bill Gay, mm-hmm. who lives in Long Beach, California. And he starts with his buddies, many of which are playing at Disney. He starts the America's Brass Band. And uh, and they're phenomenal. And he, as Bill will tell you, he said, yeah, man, I, he was the cornet player and a bad one. So he said, yeah, I, I played in the band. And as they kept getting better and better, he wound up playing bass drum. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So he he's such a funny dude. So anyway, he meets up with this Australian lady who was going, I think she was going to school in California, but her name is Philippa Burgess. And they marry. And um, they eventually, Philippa wants to come to Lexington, to the University of Kentucky, to do her PhD. So on this very topic again. So in the middle of that, he's, and again, he's an avid historian. He's been in this reenactment bands for, you know, many years, about mm-hmm. 10 years at that time. And so they said, well, let's just start a band here as part of, just like you, as part of their PhD studies. Mm-hmm. So they start this band and they, and uh, he gets in, he's in the civil war reenactor world. She really is not, she's more in the academia, but he has all the connections. And yeah. uh, so they, they start a band and they call it Haley's Cornet Band. I think, I think it's the name of it. So they go, they get, asked to play at a reenactment so they're out there their very first gig i got like an eight-piece band and they're out there playing just the ditties the the easiest tunes you can play and uh (laughs) they evidently at some point get asked whether jokingly or not to play like crowd mary uh and out of fear of oh my god we're gonna lose our gig they on the spot make up crowd mary yeah, on exactly. Civil War band, it's, I can only imagine what it sounded like. Yeah, or, or whatever, yeah. it may not have been primary, but it was a it was a you know, modern tune. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, Freebird. And uh, so they start playing, and I'm. It sounded so bad. They vowed from that day forward, oh, we got to change our name. So that's that's how you saw that. So they, disassociation. That's funny. right. Just so so they and Philippa and her research had done that. She had uh, through microfilm found that there was a band in Lexington, Kentucky. That kept popping up, kept popping up, and it was Saxon's cornet band. It was uh, basically uh, a band that was uh, started by this uh, sign painter in Lexington. His name was Henry Saxon. He had a musical family, and so they had a, they had a band. So they just took that moniker, and from that day forward, vowed to never play anything other than Civil War music. That's funny. It was uh was the Haley's band? created before 1989 or was 1989 you think when that that name no, change happened it, well i think they happened both like a month apart from each other gotcha gotcha yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious oh man yeah. do, do you know if uh the modern the modern reenacting band is based off of the original in terms of uh uniforms and stuff like that also uh, similar uh the, the actual uniforms that we wear um are actually designed after the marine band of the day but mm-hmm. we, we we use them as kind of a town band now when i joined the band we and just up until probably 19, uh 2002 three somewhere in that fall we would wear whatever color we had we had three uniforms we had a blue and a gray and a, the, the reds that we traditionally worn mm-hmm. um because you know it was whoever was hiring us <laughs> you know yeah. Uh, yeah. we need a union band okay so there you go and as a matter of fact, even when we, we did a tour of Taiwan and regretted, we all hated this decision after the fact, but we actually went just for the sake of education. We had half the band in blue and half the band in gray and then tried to do a, a, a narrative around that. Just plain. Mm-hmm. So just, it was again, just for visual, we were in a place where uh, obviously there was a language barrier. So we had to make sure that uh, we visually did as much as possible to show. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious because I've actually, thought of that type of presentation as a possible way of maybe going forward or a way of incorporating, you know, a lot of different storylines, kind of not having uh, a consistent uniformed band, but kind of like having like 
one person in gray, one person in blue, one person wearing a field musician uniform. How did that work for you guys doing half and half? It was okay. I think I think it it it, it allowed for what we needed it to. Again, it was a tour in an Asian speaking country that mm-hmm. we just wanted to make sure that they saw, they understood, they could visually do do as you know take in as much as possible. We had yeah. a, a narrator, which we always have had, but that narrator also had a translator, so uh-huh. that really worked. With the timing was really tough. So yeah, I got you, got you. So the original Saxons band, though we have. Uh, we have the uniforms we wear are just a basic town band, which we do know we have a picture uh, or two pictures actually of the original Saxons cornet, and uh, they're wearing a a short coat version, but it's a it's just a you know a band uniform. And then with the band currently, uh, you guys are all on period instruments, right? Yep. Do you guys play on over the shoulder horns or upright horns or mix of both or all of the above? Um, we have fewer over the shoulder horns than we used to have. We actually, at one point we were trying to, uh, we were trying to be all things. Civil war band, uh, and that we were trying to you know, make sure we had as many of each. And we would try to depict, you know, if we were out doing a parade, we would do more of the over, over the shoulder. And, uh, even though we had, we actually had a matched tuba and a baritone. They were from the same set, yeah. uh, that they, we, we got them. Oh, this is great. Well, they played awful and you could, there was no, there was no fixing it. So, Eventually, yeah. we sold them for a lot of money because they're matched pair, but yeah. they're probably sitting in the museum somewhere. But we eventually just got rid of that. Other than the the baritone player in our band, he has his own baritone. It's, I think it's a Graves or something, and it is a fantastic instrument. And we keep that one. But we have to, like when we're in concert, we actually will try to put a shell behind him. So but for the most part, we're a, a, a potpourri. Yeah, for sure. And those and those instruments are band owned. You were saying. Uh, some are, some aren't. My, uh, the baritone player, I think, is the only person who owns a few of them. But gotcha, everything gotcha. else is band owned. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you know anything off the top of your head uh, besides maybe the the matching horns that you used to have that are maybe a uh, a little bit more notable or maybe more showy or something that the band is particularly proud no, to have? No, we no, not now. The ones we have now are are just functional in that they play really well. Uh, we at one point we had a presentation horn that we bought that was beautiful and all this other stuff. We kind of got we we got when eBay came out. That was the world's worst thing to ever happen <laughs> because we we literally would sit after rehearsal with our finger on the button waiting for somebody because we're bidding on a horn and we right. got caught up in that for a while. Hmm. And uh, we 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 drove the market up. I hate to say it for about a year just because we were constantly buying these horns and stuff and we got taken away from the music and finally like we don't care. These horns not don't just because they're pretty doesn't mean that they play well and that at the end of the day is really all that matters. Yeah. So we got we kind of moved away from that. We sold off pretty much a bunch of that stuff. Um, right. the people who would take better care of them and who really wanted them more and uh, we just we just want something that plays in tune as much as possible and and we do try uh, one of the, the focal points of the band and this is always a, a sticky point especially with new guys who come in the band. We try to use period mouthpieces, uh, the, and and I have found that when you do that, the horn plays better in tune with itself. You yeah. have a whole lot more flexibility now. Obviously, it's if you're a modern player, it's tough. You got to be able to adjust, and it takes a while to sit on the horn for a while just to get used to it. But that's a key element to the sound. Um, Americus is probably the best Civil War band I've ever heard in my life. They're so unbelievably talented, but they'll use modern mouthpieces. And I get it because those guys, many of them are full-time Disneyland or, you know, studio players. And to switch back and forth, that would you know, very much mess them up possibly. So yeah. totally get that. Uh, we're not. So, but I hear the difference in the sound. It's a much, it's a brighter tone. And um, yeah, I, if, if we're really going to recreate the sound, recreate the sound. Yeah, for sure. Now, are the members kind of a, in Saxons, are they kind of a mix of professional musicians and teachers or kind of like what's the makeup of yeah. the group? Yeah, paraprofessionals. Uh, initially, that you had a, from the early days, it was a mix of like students with a few uh, professionals who were just interested in the Civil War music and then some actual like Civil War reenactors who had some musical uh, ability. Um, the band kept getting better and better and better and those Unfortunately, those players just found themselves not playing as much. But um, yeah, everybody has some uh, a degree of musical uh, instruction. Most almost everybody mm-hmm. has a bachelor's degree in it. Uh, the yeah. baritone player, like a, a, he's our music director. He uh, he has a master's in trombone from Eastman. So oh, wow. he's a great player. So. Okay, okay. 
Uh, how how many people altogether are in the in the band? Uh, well, we have thirteen that we go out with, but that includes a narrator. So there's uh, that's the brass and percussion and a narrator who's been with us been with the band since 1989. Okay. And, but there are probably you know 16, 17 people that we pull from. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you guys ever do configurations of like a quintet setup, or do you only ever go out with a full thirteen piece? We we have two sizes that we we go out and we go on a full band, which is a thirteen piece brass band. Which you know, I think technically, and again, I'm not the historian. I think really a, a, the military size would be sixteen or even maybe twenty four at the yeah. time. But for yeah. us, a, yeah. right to to fulfill, to get the to fill out all of the parts, we have that thirteen. We have, um, <clears throat> and I'm not always hip to this or like this but we have a we have a what we call a small band and it's a nine piece we've taken the scores especially the easier tunes that mm-hmm. they're not you know that the you can pull those down because they double a little bit yeah, and for sure mm-hmm. but we'll do that for living history stuff and maybe some of school gotcha yeah kind of like the the pop stuff is a little thinner in in we, to be very honest people who can't afford the big band so yeah that's true yeah. too <laughs> yeah we we we're in a similar position we have a, a six piece that goes out to a lot of these history days and things like that around this area. Right. You were mentioning that, that you came on for a recording session as your first gig with Saxton's. Does the band have uh, multiple CDs that they came out with? Or? Yeah, we have, uh, gosh, actually, I mean, our website, I think we've got like four that are out there. We actually, but just this past, uh, before, um, the uh, video that we made that you all saw, we had literally just had a, a powwow, virtual powwow, because we have so much stuff in the can from over the years that, like, can we put some of this together and re- release something? So we have, believe it or not, we have a couple of albums on the way out. Uh, oh, wow. with oh, wow. Stephen, uh, Stephen Foster, we've recorded a ton of his tunes. We're going to put a few more in there. And then we actually have what's going to be uh, A Night at the Opera or some opera type themed volume one because there's so yeah. much opera literature yeah that's right true. that yeah. um oh man that's, that, that's awesome that's exciting to know that there's stuff on the way so oh yeah 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 we'll definitely be keeping an eye out for that i don't know if you've seen we have a discography page yeah. on our website yeah so as those come out we'll be sure to, you know i'm sure we'll see it on facebook too but we'll obviously add to that list as those come out that's exciting how many of those recordings have you been a part of all of them all of them. <laughs> nice. nice. So that, that recording session that you got brought on for initially was the first CD. Yes. Was. And that, well, that was actually not a CD. It was as for a tape. I think they were doing it for a, just like a, a, a demo tape to hand out to get gigs. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that that ever made the light of day. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's like a secret EP. Right. right. <laughs> kind of yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure that it probably would be preferred that it stay there too <laughs> it stay <Maybe>. secret yeah <laughs> do you have any uh, interesting or, or funny stories or, or what was kind of like the general procedure for you guys for recording i know some people um you know try and do them in a historic location or stuff well, like that that's kind of actually by uh, th- there's a story there by accident um the building that i'm actually in i'm, I'm the director of music and worship at first united methodist church in frankfort kentucky Mm-hmm. Uh, this congregation has been around since the late 1700s mm-hmm. and uh, where I work, we have two worship spaces and the original sanctuary was built in 1857 or eight, somewhere in there. And I have re- done research that found that Henry Saxon, who, he, let, me, let me back up. Henry Saxon actually had a group. You have Henry Saxon, the dad whose son, Henry Saxon Jr., actually would become a full-time traveling, kind of regionally famous musician. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, he would eventually play in this church. So, oh, wow. that, And that is where we record. Neat. That's awesome. Now, now, we did not find out that Henry had played here until like a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. We've recorded many albums in the same building right there where he performed. So the Civil War gods and the music gods are like very yeah. happy. <laughs> what 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 was the that uh discovery process like who who was able to find out that uh yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm henry saxon's uh shadow um i'm the i, I know more than his family even knows his family <laughs> we, we have come in contact over the years i started getting uh, we thought well you know if we're going to be authentic i guess when we go out in public i would be henry saxon jr because i'm the elite flat cornet and that's mm-hmm. so um I started doing research and I've been doing it for about 20 some odd years. And we've met up with the, some, some family members, descendants, and mm-hmm. I know way more than they know. <laughs> so, oh, but they crazy. have provided me some stuff. And 
uh, you know, the Library of Congress has uh, uh, a lot of resources. He actually went on to uh, to be, like I said, a regional uh, composer, conductor, and he's got some pieces that are actually on the Library of Congress site and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So, so for finding that particular nugget of information that he played in in your church, what uh, what what was that moment like? D did you? have a feeling that you were coming up on it for some reason or like the hair what? on my arm stood up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, even this past, uh, probably January or February, my, I have a, a 15 year old daughter is doing a, uh, ancestry research project. And so she has uh, ancestry.com subscription through her schools. I'm like, Hey, let's look up Henry Saxon. So mm -hmm. we do, I find a document that I had never found, which I, had, I, I thought I'd found everything. And it shows where he was, uh, at, for uh, just a little snippet of history, lived in St. Louis. I'm like, really? That's actually him. That's his wife. So we research it, and I go to Google, Google, map, Google map search. He lived about a block away from this old courthouse in St. Louis. I'm like, I am following this dude. Wow. <laughs> his entire history. He li literally lived about a block away from the old courthouse. Wow. where We played four shows a day for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Yikes. That's insane. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, pretty cool. But was the information that you found out about the church, was that like a, an old program that you found or a newspaper yeah. clipping? Or, yeah. yeah. Went through the Kentucky Historical Society. is literally right down the street from where I live. I live in a very – or I work in a very historic area of uh, Frankfurt, which is very historic uh, mm -hmm. in itself. So I went down there and just did a little research on a day off and sure enough, just found a, a program uh, that – popped up and it was in, in uh, it was on a recital henry saxton uh, again junior we're gonna call him he would uh he would start he would play in saxon's cornet band saxon's cornet band actually was only in existence for about two or three years oh, wow. but uh from that point he did he had, there was saxton's minstrels which actually did many 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 shows in lexington kentucky there was uh, saxon and trost social orchestra there was whatever he needed he'd do he just put saxons on the front of it and there you, there go. you go dude was extremely talented he was a euphonium player and uh he would arrange and write a lot of music and uh, he was just he was very well known and uh he would play for every uh governor who was inaugurated and he would go to louisville quite a bit and there's just lots of documentation so yeah um I just researched him, followed him through his little career, and it's just kind of weird how we have actually shadowed it from yeah. behind. Yeah, man, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, that seems like, at least to, to my knowledge, most brass bands were led by the first E-flat cornet player, as as you guys are also. Do you, do you know if uh, if Junior was leading this band kind of from the front, or was he kind of like the behind-the-scenes guy? And I, he I think he will. He, he, actually, his brother, Oren, I think was the cornet player. Gotcha. Um, and Oren would unfortunately die at about 30. I think evidently a, uh, a instrument case fell on his chest. Yes. And uh, so, so the, so the story goes and died, yeah. but there's a, there's a warning story to tell people yeah. to, to be worried about. Never pick up the baritone case. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. So he would, he would, he would unfortunately pass, but uh, no, I think, I think junior was leading from, from the baritone chair, which is exactly what happens in our band. David Henderson is our, now granted, well, I'm the guy on the end and I'm, I'm the tempo giver whenever we need one and I'll start. And, mm -hmm. But David is the musical. We all subject everything to him because he's got the golden ear and he, he's just a fantastic musician. So uh, it's very, again, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. How, how you keep on having all these aligning right. uh, trajectories and histories and stuff. That's awesome. <laughs> It sounds like you guys have like a script that goes along and you have different pre-written shows. Can you kind of yeah. talk about that a little bit? And yeah, well, well, when we got, when we got an agent, um, that was a thing she said, you know, I have to have a product to sell and you know, she would go to um, presenting uh, conventions and things like that where people are just buying shows, you know, either you're right next to, you know, Jack Daniels or anybody else, you know, it's an orchestra, or Wynton Marsalis, you know, they're literally there just to, to sign, make up their roster for their artist series. And so, uh, she said, I need some shows. So we put together a quote, uh, what we call a grand concert. And um, it is a two part show. It's a uh, first half, second half. It's about 90 minutes long. And uh, it, you know, it, it can, it can vary at any time. They'll never play the same music ever, but mm. you know, they, uh, they, they have a, you know, an opening act and the second part might be a night of opera or, you know, but they're all with narration and, 
with uh, authentic jokes. Uh, we have a lot of humor in the shows, which I think that's always surprised our audiences how funny. I mean, I, I, literally, I have from all across the U.S. and all ages, people will just say, I cannot believe how entertaining. That was extremely funny. Hmm. Uh, and the jokes are period jokes. They come from uh, minstrel shows, and, and they're they're appropriate. They're not. They have nothing to do with. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just they're corny. I mean, they're they're the worst jokes ever. But they're so funny that yeah. and and Nikki, who is the narrator, he he's, he's excellent at pulling it off. So that's awesome. We, we try to let the music stand on its own, and that's exact. We have documentation of Saxon's band playing actually in Frankfurt at the time back in the 1860s. And the, the, the one that the newspaper reporters talks about how funny the show was and their jokes yeah. were great. Interesting. How, how many sh- different shows do you guys have? We have three that we kind of advertise, but we do a potpourri basically. There was, like I said, at one point there was one that was called a day in the life, which literally would start out with the band marching in and we would, it was all led by a bugle and I was the bugler. And basically we would use the bugle calls as a thread to teach people about a day in the life of a civil war soldier. I mean, it started out with Reveille. I mean, we would actually, we would march, I would play, uh, drummers would come out and I would play a bugle call and the band would march in and right from the get go we play with the grace from memory uh, from right. standing and then from that point we sit down and I would lead the bugle calls and there'd be narration and there's a little humor in there too and we just basically and, but from you know go through a day in the life of the soldier from the from the point of uh, and putting and helping put someone in the context of what it was like to be in the war you hear them uh, you know uh, opening um, Revelate at the beginning of the day, and then we would play a nice peppy tune, and then we would have a sick call, and you know, and somebody might feign sickness just to get out of, and we'd play a song, and then the general would come, and we'd play the general call, and then we'd play a marching tune. Oh, there's a call to battle, so we would play a marching song, and then we would play, you know, while they're out, we would play tunes that they would play, you know, operatic tunes that were documented you know that they would hear from the battlefield, and then there would be a ball, a dance that night, and we would play a dance tune, and there would be, uh, you know, uh, so it basically just goes documents the day and helps the listener that who understand what it was like to be a soldier in the Civil War and honestly also see how kind of how field music worked within the context of uh, the band music as well, uh, yeah, the big yeah. balls and stuff. So, so we have that show and uh, then that we would come back using the second half and play again operatic type things or stuff that's flashier. There's always a solo or two in there and. Um, that's one thing that Saxons has always been very gifted with. Always had some great cornet and baritone solo. David's an unbelievable solos. So we've had Hiram Diaz came and played a solo. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. You, you fucking guys in DC. Yeah. He played a brass band festival in uh, Danville a year or two ago. And we've been very fortunate to have some just phenomenal musicians uh, play with us. And awesome. uh, just, you know, putting the shows together has always been really really easy for us we also have you know like smaller things a history history and horns i think is what we call it that's just for more educational hands-on uh, things but that helps whenever we're going out to uh, you know uh, i've got a conference where i'm trying to sell the band literally uh, they're going to say, okay, well, what shows do you have? You know, and we have stuff with orchestra and we've actually played some with some uh, college bands, Milligan university, we did the thing. And so, you know, it's uh, just trying to be as versatile as possible because we're, it's, it's such a hard sell. I mean, you know, it's a civil war era brass band, you know, by itself, it's just, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> How has Saxon's cornet band's their mission statement changed uh, throughout the years? Because you've been around for for a while, uh, and we know based on a video that the band released, I guess last week at this point, um, that you've recently made a change. But that is that the first time the mission statement has changed? No, um, the mission I think while while it has changed a couple of times, it's actually in some ways stayed the same. Uh, I think sure. we just had to f- refocus on it. Uh, so initially, the band was, you know, Bill and Philippa started this band. It was just a more of a social experiment for her research and um, and his Civil War needs. And uh, so they had a little band, and then it got better and got better. And so they started playing tons of reenactments, and I mean, t- big reenactments, and. Mm-hmm. They got uh, quite a bit of exposure. Um, they were in the movie Gettysburg, and they started getting some, you know, some decent jobs. Um, now, to the as, which attracted better players and things like that. Um, 
and people like me who just, I didn't know, again, like I said, I didn't know really anything about the Civil War, but really got interested in it once we started playing. And the mu- music has always been beautiful. Gosh, right. so, so really, so really good. And it, again, it's just this chamber music. We enjoy being with each other. I love the trips that we were taking. But after a while, um, it got to be what we thought was we thought there's a bigger audience out there and we want to reach them. And so at a certain point, there was a struggle between Bill and Philippa and players in the band, including myself. It wasn't personal. We didn't dislike them. It's just we wanted to go a different direction. So we came to terms and said, how about this? What if we buy the band from you? And we want to take it in a different direction. And we kind of, it was got a little bit of a mutiny, but uh, again, uh, out of love and care, f- f- friendships. So we bought mm-hmm. the band. We incorporated, f- started a 501c3, said that from this point on, we we're going to be an educational you know, ensemble that is here to keep this music alive and reach the biggest audience we can. And then at that point, we got an agent, um, April Brumfield from Brumfield and Associates, who lived in the area and had a lot of experience. And she really knew our niche. And she did a great job of getting us into theaters and some really decent paying jobs and getting them bigger audiences. And again, set up a tour. We had a, a Taiwan tour set up and we were really thriving at that point. The mm-hmm. Civil War was hot. We we're hitting a lot of 150th anniversaries of things. And we pretty much got out of the, the reenactment field for the most part, which was great for us because I did, was tired of sleeping outside. And uh, <laughs> just, let's just put it right out there. I'm like, eh, this is great if you're young, but this is, yeah, as we're getting older, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I'd rather yeah. play in a, uh, you know, pay a lot more money, shorter concert. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> you can put a lot more right. people. I'm yeah. about this. But we were reaching a big, bigger audience. And, uh, and again, that was our goal. And uh, mm-hmm. so at that point, we, sh- we shifted. We still were doing living, we still do, still do living history things, uh, like if a historic site wants to have some music. But as in the past 10 to 15 years, all of that has really slowed down. Uh, when 2008 hit, the, the financial crisis that we went through there, that really wrecked a whole bunch of it. And throughout all of this, we have come back uh, every few years struggling with, you know, uh, public perception of the band. We we took away Civil War band from uh, addressing ourselves actually several years ago. We would just mm-hmm. say we're Victorian era Victorian era brass band, uh, trying to keep this music alive and um, you know doing that. Uh, yeah. So it's always been a, a there's been this sleeping topic that we've been tiptoeing around and and you know we've a- actually had a few historic sites in particular which would say. Um, you know, we would hire us. They they knew what they were hiring, but they would tell us, "You can't play Dixie." Yeah, yeah. Or you know, you can't do this or you can't do that. Anyway, uh, but yeah, there are situations like that where we just kept getting harder and harder to present. And we have since day one had major problem with the fact that you know would have an African American friend or you know colleague who like well or female like you know you you can't play in the band because. Mm-hmm. The real Civil War band would not have had you playing with us, and you know. Playing. So that was that was an active decision that you guys were making to uh, try to make it historically accurate in that yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, trying to. I mean, even down to the glasses. You know, we, mm-hmm. with exception, whenever we ha- have to hire somebody like a day before a gig, and you know, we like, y- y- can you wear contacts? Because we got to have, we want everything we do to look, sound, be just like it. Yeah. unfortunately uh, there's just <clears throat> part of that that we don't need anymore so right. we felt as of this recording uh which is mid-june 2020 about a week ago you guys put out a video uh that's gaining some traction within the the community uh in regards to, to this decision so can you guys can you kind of talk a little bit about uh the decision made to essentially make that video and revise the the mission statement in that sense yeah we it was i let it but uh everybody I led the discussion, but everybody was on board. Uh, we have a board of directors, which is basically just guys in the band. Um, and we rotate on and off and it's not a, it's not a very strict organization, but you know, it's just a collective whole that runs it. And um, I just went to them and said, you know, if David Goins wants to participate in this, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done with that imagery. And uh, I, I just think the time has passed. I really love the music. Uh, I really love the music and I really want to keep playing, but I have no desire personally to go out and 
have the imagery, especially if it makes someone else feel uncomfortable, anybody. And if it, if it, it limits the, our ability to present the music in the best way. And it has, it has, I mean, there were a couple of players that we've had actually on recordings who were female. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you would never see them, but yeah, yeah. they're great players. So why wouldn't we use them? Well, it just, it just, it was just done. We're done, done with that. So we really care about the restoration of the music and we want to keep, we want to keep that alive. You know, it's a very important part of the American band history. I'm not a musicologist. Right. I'm just a dude who plays a trumpet in the cornet, but uh, you know, the music that in this little bitty snippet of time is just phenomenal. And it's amazing to see how it all came together and to see how the influences from all these different nationalities that were just coming over to America and how they were, you know, putting their stamp on this new thing. It was brand new, man, you know, and just, uh, and uh, financially, luckily the war came along because then the bands just took off. I'm like, man, if you can, if I was a horn maker back then, <laughs> millionaire overnight. Yeah, for yeah seriously. So, you know, we want to keep, we want to keep the music alive and especially the, the, the ability to have the discussion of saying, this is where it all began right here. That band that you're in, in your school, it started right here with this type of ensemble and play that. And let the, you just close your eyes, listen, there you go. That's all we care about. Exactly. Right. So, so based on the, the video, which maybe you could briefly summarize, I know we kind of been talking around it, but uh, how, what you guys mentioned or how what you mentioned in that video, how that's going to affect uh, the band going forward and what changes are kind of directly being made in, in regards to yeah. that. Well, I, I, the video states that uh, you know, we've been around for about 30 years and that we've, uh, we've had a great long run at being where we are. We're developing and to continue that development as humans and as a, as an ensemble organization, we're ditching the, the visual element of our, performance we no longer feel the need to portray a civil war era brass band um Mm -hmm. we'll talk about it we want to put it in historical context but we want to be an inclusive band that allows blacks women anybody to play we want the best performers playing we don't want our our visual representation to limit that so we're we're no longer doing that we're going to be a performing ensemble it may be that no one ever hires us again Mm -hmm. oh well uh you know, our mission is to accurately play the music that was written and, uh, and to maybe document it. All we may ever do is document this music. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I presented that to the board and to the rest of the band, again, one of the, one of the band members, again, one of the original band members is our, um, our narrator, Nikki Hughes, who is a very, very well-known historic Civil War historian. And uh, he was, I, I thought, if anybody's going to give me some kickback on it, it'd be he. Nope. Hmm. So he was all for it. He said, this is exactly where we need to be. And this is exactly what I do. He wants to be able to put the historical accurate spin on the music and how it really bad or good um, at life. So uh, for live performances and stuff, if you guys continue, if you get calls for (laughs) for a live performance, is that, uh, are you guys going to wear concert black? Are you still going to be in, it will be no, uniforms. No, no uniforms. No, as a matter of fact, if you want to buy some, I don't know where you can get some. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, no, we're going to be in uh, modern dress. Probably something uh, you know, that at least will be visually captivating. But no, it'll be. We won't worry about any of that. Gotcha. So you wouldn't be like adopting like a, a town band uniform type of thing. Don't know. I have no idea. We haven't even gotten that far. Gotcha. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. As of this recording, you guys right. released the video what eight days ago i think so (laughs) well i think i think the the kind of the larger point is that um like you're saying you're trying to preserve the the music of this time and as far as like the civil war imagery goes that all things considered there was time-wise was a short amount of time when you're talking about the overall band history of the united states you know so it's i mean it's it's a question that kind of every organization is going to have to ask themselves like what what is the important part of the mission that you want to do? You know, so if being a dedicated civil war reenactment band is what you want to do, then, then do that. But like, like you said, I mean, it's, it became more than that. And if you're trying to preserve a larger history, really, you know, there, there is no need for that uniform and that imagery. And I, I have to say, I mean, I, I, 
am totally on board too. And I think that it's going to go a long way to preserve, um, again, like the larger context of band history. Cause there's, there's brass band music from before the civil war and there's brass band music from after it, you know, it's, it's not just those four years nope. while the civil war did, as you, as you said, provide a big boom to it because all these regiments, all these bands were existing and like each regiment had a band and there was a lot of production of this music around that time. While it is important, it's not the complete picture, you know? So right. I, I think it's, I think it's a very, you know, well thought out decision and, ultimately is going to do a lot of good for preserving the history around, you know, that, that whole, the Victorian era. There, there are a couple of instances. Well, first of all, I'm a dad. I got three mm -hmm. kids and I have to look them square in the face every night. And, uh, and I, and I just don't feel like I could do that responsibly without doing this as, cause they know they, they, you know, they think it's cool that dad's in, a, in this band that plays, you know, um, I, you know, dad, how come there aren't any black guys in the band? Well, you know, so, and we, and, and also back, and when I go back, there's a, there's a gentleman I went to college with, his name is James Jackson. He plays euphonium in the Coast Guard mm -hmm. band. Yeah. One of my you know, dear friends growing up and uh, he never played in Saxons because, and I'm embarrassed by that. So yeah. wow. it's, it's, it's just, you know, like this, there's no need for this. Um, right. I appreciate, I appreciate historians and I appreciate everything. I understand, um, I understand everybody's outlook um, on, on the subject. I just, personally just don't need to do it anymore right so that's kind of in a in a band context obviously do you have any opinions on the the hobby of civil war reenacting in general because if you wanted to kind of like take a step back you know we had a an episode a few weeks ago with a friend of ours dominic giardino who's involved with colonial williamsburg mm -hmm. uh so you know you have living history and not that time period uh living history in the 19th century surrounding the civil war like where do you think that that uh activity stands today Woof. well yeah. we've uh, <laughs> we've known for a long time and again i'm using nikki as my reference uh because he had he's he's very act he has been very active in the civil war reenactment uh, world he was very highly regarded like editor and he goes around doing talks on authentic dress and behavior of the time and medicine and stuff like that so the guy is extremely knowledgeable and he was he was a link to us getting many of these civil war reenactment gigs i mean big ones too like mm -hmm. 150th and so 125th so nikki so we saw the the handwriting on the wall a long time ago and he has always been uh, maybe uh nose in the air uh offended by the reenactors who just show up just so they can live out their racist ways you know like oh boy let me shoot the gun you know i'm like that this is not living history mm -hmm. so he is you know what we've we felt for a long time you know this what where's this go this is this would be great if this was truly a, a, a appropriate living history event so we could see and see both sides of it that'd be awesome but unfortunately you don't Where's this? Where do I see the Civil War reenactment and that entire uh, community? I can't imagine it surviving uh, very much, and I'm not sure that it does. Um, if it can't be put in an appropriate context, which includes a lot of Black history behind it, so um, I might be totally wrong with that. But no, again, no, yeah. focusing on your band's uh, portrayal of the music now, shifting the focus squarely on the music uh, doesn't quite get bands out of uh out of the woods you know there's still some rectifying yep. and some justification mm -hmm. that needs to happen just on the musical side so knowing from personal experience let me pose the question this way what is your band's current relationship and how do you focus or how do you uh maneuver playing dixie <laughs> i don't know you can i don't think you do it without uh without narrative yeah. Um, context, you know, you super got, important. You have to have context. Yeah. And I mean, it was a very popular tune uh, just, you know, on its own. Uh, you know, it, ha it has history prior to the, you know, to it being the Southern national anthem. So, um, but it has to have context. And if it doesn't, I mean, look, check this out. I mean, we've got, we, in 2011, we had Jim Kernow write up because we thought, you know what, we want to go to the next level. Let's build, let's write, a, let's commission a piece that will introduce the person who has no idea what a civil war brass band is to, to our music. And we're going to do that by enveloping it within a larger work for modern orchestra. Nice. So we commissioned uh, Jim Kernow back in 2011. He's a dear friend of ours, lived, grew, lived in the area for 
30, 40 years. Anyway, he wrote a piece for us and um, it has narration, original music, but in, out of the original music, or actually out of the narration, all of a sudden you hear the brass band. And so we're playing exact, and we're playing exactly, we did not alter what we played at all. It's right from the manuscripts. Uh-huh. You hear the band play snippets of tunes, very popular tunes. And then it goes right back into some, some melodic music. It's a 12 minute piece with malice towards none. Mm-hmm. In the middle of that though is Dixie. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so we're going to have to look at that. How are we going to, we have this original work that, you know, has our tune, that tune right smack dab in the middle of it. How are we going to, mm-hmm. How if if we even perform it again, which I think we will, but you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna set that up? If- yeah. Do you think that you guys, you know, I know we're we're talking context and and talking about it, but do you think that there's a possibility that you guys will just stop playing Dixie? Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Very possibly. It just you know, I, I, it has to ha- has to be relevant, has to be mm-hmm. important, and if we're going to present it, why are we presenting it? And if it if it's extremely offensive, then why are we presenting it? So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, that gets kind of at a larger question is if you're trying to tell the history, can you, can you accurately tell the history without Dixie or without the imagery of a civil war band? And I think, yes, you can. Um, I think you can, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, again, it's, it's one of those decisions that bands and organizations and just everybody in general is going to have to really think about, you know, behind it and what the intent is, you know, if, if to, to play it and properly contextualize it within the history, then, you know, all good. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just the bigger question that I think, um, like you said, has been kind of simmering for a long time, I think in, in the reenact, whether it's the reenactment world or the, the Victorian era brass band world, you know, it's, it's just, that question that now I think is, is coming a little more clear into focus. We're going to have to address it. And before yeah. we ever say the first word in public, we got to be, make sure that it's not the history according to the white man and right. that mm-hmm. it's, it's given appropriate attention. And, you know, and that, I mean, we used to play at the Dan Emmett festival in Mount Vernon, Ohio for like four or five years in a row. I mean, like, yeah. gosh, how are they going to address that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is that still going on? I have no idea. Yeah, well, yeah, I've known that this is, you know, something that can, you know, ruffle some feathers. So, so I've been trying to read a bunch of books. I just got one yesterday that's just on the Confederate flag and like a historical dive into it and its presentation and how it's evolved over time. So I'm like reading about the Confederate flag. I'm reading about monuments, uh, hoping to go down to Richmond in the next week just to, to see the, the graffiti on, on some of the statues just to see some of that just to, to learn about it but yeah I think as long as we're not ignorant you know of what we're doing and finding ways to be well educated musicians and being able to contextualize and present things you know as best we can from a uh, intent of being historically informative you know without bias which you know is impossible to do there's always bias but yeah I think as long as we're open to, to being I'm just rambling, but yeah, <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you think, um, do you anticipate other organizations making similar changes or having similar conversations uh, in the future? I, I hope that's the case that people kind of re-examine everything. If, and um, if they want to exist. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not our, that's not reason. I mean, we're saying that right now, knowing we very well may never ever play again. So it's, mm-hmm. um, but that's okay. I'm okay with that decision. Uh, it's yeah. been, it's been uh, like, you know, where we were playing 30 jobs a year, we're down to about three. Of course, we're okay with that too. I mean, there was, it's right. like you know, <laughs> travel, you know, high paying gig, tra- traveling, fewer jobs. Okay. I'm with that. But, um, but it's been that the, it, we've seen a decline in the entire civil war thing over the past many years, 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of that's coming off of the, the one fiftieth, right? everything kind of right. built up to that. And now we're on the, the other side of the hill coming off from right. it. So yeah. And then all the, the social political stuff going on now doesn't yep. help. <laughs> no, sure. it's, it's yeah, for sure. So, something that I've uh, asked some other guests and kind of since it's in line with some of the research I'm doing and the work I'm doing with, uh, with the Mason band uh, along the same lines as asking if you're seeing, expecting a change to happen with other bands 
do you think that this form of music from a musical standpoint should be expanded upon? And do you think like more groups should exist or universities should pick it up as an educational tool? Or do you think that it's kind of fine <laughs> the way it is? Well, I, I, I've always thought that it needed to be expanded on, especially in colleges. I mean, if you're, if you're a music ed major and you're going to be a band director somewhere, man, you really need to understand where, you know, how you, the music you're playing originated. I mean, you know, it ha it, we, we have this music that has an, an E flat lead, you know, and how, when did that trans, when did that transfer over to a B flat lead, B flat cornet you know, or clarinet lead? And, you know, how did that all evolve? And I think it's extremely important um, to learn about. Now we got like a day and a half of it in a band methods class. And I was, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, I do think now, obviously there's an equipment thing, uh, you know, there aren't, there aren't uh, horns sitting around everywhere. So obviously, but if there was maybe at least some type of, um, of availability for the music to be presented, even on a modern instrument, just so that they can experience, understand, say, here you go, here's how this worked out and here's how it evolved. And, and here's the dude who invented it, Adolf Sax, and you know, these are sax horns and it's a voice like a choir. And here's, you know, uh, here's why they, these were so successful and, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah, definitely. It, it's interesting that you say a day and a half because I think Steve and I have had this discussion too, where like music history essentially skips over, like in colleges, essentially skips over this period of history. You know, it kind of goes from, you know, Beethoven and some maybe impressionistic piano composers and then goes right into like Schoenberg and Berg right. and, and that kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> well, and, and, and on top of that, you're playing, it, the, the music was not the highbrow orchestra music. Yeah. You know, it was not the elite music. It was the music of the, especially in America, of the common Joe. I mean, it was, it was the the, the poor people's music. Yeah. You know, there was no orchestral experience in America until later in the 19th century, and that was again for the wealthy who didn't have anything to do with it. So you know, yeah, I, I, unless you talk about you know Gilmore and Sousa, I mean, they don't know anything at all about. And granted, it was a very short period of time we're talking about, but it pretty influential, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that music was probably heard by more people. Uh, oh than, man, yeah, yeah. And it, going off of what Chris said about you know the whole music uh, music history curriculum at the college level, I mean, I just finished what my second year of a of a doctoral degree, you know, and I've gone straight through. But it it took the up until the second year of my master's degree at Penn State for me to come across and be able to register for a class that was about band literature, and it right. took through then the second year of my doctoral deg degree to be able to register and take a class or even have one offered on African-American music history of the 19th century. So it's like, I, I hope that this conversation and this current climate kind of bleeds into specifically college music history. You know, it's, it's not just the, the European, uh, you know, box Beethoven's Mozart that yeah. wrote music. Um, you know, their music I, I think over the years has evolved and become regarded as some of the best music out there, but it's not the only music out there. So uh yeah, it's another it's another one of those fields that I hope kind of re examines a little bit. The uh and, and, and there's so much study that needs to be done and I'm not necessarily sure that I'm the we're the person to do it, but I, I do love editing and fixing and finding these nuggets and think, gosh, when was the last time this piece was ever heard by anybody? And, and the, that's the thing that the discovery that happens that we want to, that we want to keep alive. And this has been our, for a long time is you, you look at these pieces of music again, that you think, when was this played last? And we go through and we edit it or whatever. And then you realize just through the discovery, a couple of things, first of all, these were amazing musicians. Mm -hmm. yeah. First of all, who played that part? Because it's so hard that I could, I can't even get through it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a door latch quick step and a couple of these other uh, pump handle quick step, which have funny, goofy names. But whoever the E flat cornet player was on that, wow. Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. And all this operatic, I mean, they're 11 minutes long. And, you know, and these, obviously, you know, you got these Europeans who are coming over who, are just amazing musicians. Never heard of them. Still don't even know who they are. Some of them, like who arranged that? I don't know. It was just in that band book, and we have, you know. Yeah, it's insane. Unbelievable. 
do you guys play any uh, pieces of music that you guys orchestrate out yourself from based off a of piano score? Piano score? To- we, have a, we have a few. Um, yeah. Again, uh, very, I, I do that very uh, in the past, maybe even more so now. That's a touchy subject for me personally. Uh, I, I, my, my snobbery comes in like, well, hang on a second. You know, why, why would, but especially if we have like, sometimes we'll just have all we have are the E flat cornet part and the tuba part. From that, in our performance history, because we've been playing it again for 30 years, David Henderson's the dude who's going to arrange it, and he's going to use appropriate practice, performance practice, and he's going to mm-hmm. arrange something based on here's the style of that tune or whatever. And he's, we've done that with a few, um, we've done actually a few operatic things. We did, we have an arrangement of William Tell. I think he actually found that that was, I mean, that at the very least, <laughs> do you know we had, was that actually performed by a band somewhere? We want to at least have to know that. Mm-hmm. And if so, yes, well, we can't find any of the parts or whatever, you know, so, 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 we'll you're, piano score. so you're more okay with playing a, an arrangement that you guys did where you only had the trumpet and the tuba part and you filled it in based on your experience, then playing a completely orchestrated piece from a piano, from a piano score, score. That, that that says as performed by the such and nice. such band. Uh, well, the, probably not actually, uh, mm-hmm. but you know, it's just, um, just it, I, I'm not really comfortable with either. Um, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. But then that's I, interesting. So, but with that level of comfort, then you guys still did the, uh, the performance with uh, Cornell, the, the piece that Cornell wrote. Well, that we have, we see, we, again, we wrap that hit, uh, again a little bit differently. We're trying, with the mission on that piece was was to, to to really introduce to people who had no idea, just to give them some some place to latch on. And from that point, we'll go, I'm going to give you the Civil War band as it is, as a, as a, as a bare bones. Here we go. Um, just, you know, for my kid, in other words. Uh, but every time we made sure that when in that piece, Every time you hear the Civil War brass band, they're playing just the Civil. You hear just the Civil War brass band playing exactly as they the music they put. We never altered our the music that we mm-hmm. played in that big work. Gotcha, and, gotcha. Yeah, it, it, and we we again did that with the sole intention of this is going to allow us to reach a bigger audience and hopefully give them something that's accessible so that we can then it, because the Civil War band era Civil War era band brass band is slightly a hard sell. Mm, true to someone who doesn't know anything about it yeah and you're saying that that's an or- was originally an orchestral work with brass band kind of in it type yeah, of yeah. It's, it's it's a 12 minute work with or- original orchestral stuff that you hear the brass because of the narration you hear the brass band enter mm-hmm. and you hear us play all by ourselves there might be like an underscore like literally a drone <laughs> type thing mm-hmm. in the background but uh, padding but the, it's, it's us and um, so it's kind of like a listener's guide to the orchestra type of thing for yes, for yes. and then and the narration is uh, based off of diary entries um and the second inaugural address of you know, oh, nice. are you guys only able to perform that with an orchestra or do you have a version that's banned in narration yeah, we have banned in narration as well uh yeah, yeah. jim jim allowed david to make a band and we're uh, probably going to make a brass band a british style brass band and yeah. band oh wow now yeah, you mentioned sure. British style brass band, and that was a perfect segue into the, a question I was going to ask you. Because you're you're the music director of the um, Lexington, Lexington brass band, brass which band. is Correct. British style brass band, right? Correct. Uh-huh. How did you get involved with them? Was that something that happened because of your developing interest in American brass bands, or was that kind of separate? They were. Uh, I was a student at the University of Kentucky, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they rehearsed at the university. Skip Gray was one of the co-conductors and original founders of it, and. Um, Ian Ron, Dr. Ron Holtz, who's a very esteemed British brass, Salvation Army, particularly mm-hmm. brass band conductor. Anyway, they started a brass band at the University of Kentucky, Blackson Brass Band, and I played E flat cornet in it. Mm-hmm. And I played for about, you know, 15 years. Then I took a break and had some kids. And then and eventually Ron would retire and Vince Martino would come in and conduct. And then they asked me if I would be interested. So, yeah, I've been doing that for the past several years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very that's cool. great. I, um, I, I play with a British, a newly formed British brass band down here in Virginia. Um, we, we were supposed to go to NABBA this year, but obviously that got, that got yeah, axed. Yeah. Um, and it's been great. I mean, this, I, I guess a year and a half ago, maybe it was like my first experience with British oh, brass yeah. bands and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, it's great to see how these two bands, I mean, we, Saxons has played with LBB on concert before we did a civil war theme concert and, you know, they did a, we didn't play together, uh, for pitch reasons, but, um, 
And that's something that we've had to do when we play with the orchestra. We have a guy in the band, tuba player, who's an instrument repairman slash maker. Mm-hmm. And he literally had to make bits for us just so we could pull the oh. pitch down. Because we're about A453. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In that yeah. ballpark. And uh, you, you don't so want the orchestra to you don't want the orchestra <laughs> to come up they, and meet you, huh? They do not like that. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, we uh, yeah the the uh, it's, it's great to see how the uh, you know the Civil War era band and the Bruce style brass band are extremely similar. So how they've evolved, how they evolved out of each you know, the other, out of the other. And you're saying this piece that is being written is is one that is going to have them playing together? I uh, well, we haven't officially talked to Jim. I, mean, I was Jim went with us. We played it with the orchestra and. Um, uh, Sandusky uh, this past fall and Jim came up with us and I uh, talked to him just loosely about we need to do this with brass band too uh, because he's he's got an enormous catalog of brass band and yeah. at that point our really our our hope there is someday if we ever have a gig in Europe I think they'll never let us come home because they're going to fall <laughs> in love with it like, oh my gosh this is so yeah. cool and we'll do a lot of joint concerts <laughs> Great. Thanks. This has been a, a fantastic conversation. Where can people find out more about you and uh, some of the groups you're involved with? Sure. Saxon's Cornet Band.net is the best place to, to find us, our presence. And uh, it's going to be that website's going to be changing here uh, mm-hmm. soon just to reflect our current mission statement. But uh, it's always a great place to at least start. And you can find links to recordings. And we've got a couple of recordings, like I say, that are in the works. Uh, we're really excited about. And hopefully those will be out really soon. And uh, we'd love to come play and uh, check out the Lexington Brass Band, too. Uh, LexingtonBrassBand.com, another great British brass band site. But uh, uh, I hope that people can um, jump on board, at least uh, with our, our, our new shift, and uh, can, can look forward to, to some, some great days ahead. Thank you again to David Goins for coming onto the podcast and uh, being able to talk about some of these difficult topics, uh, something that I think is on a lot of band players' minds and, and will hopefully spark some more discussion uh, yeah, regarding these topics. This episode's featured album is High Bridge Brass, the self-titled album of the ensemble High Bridge Brass. Uh, that's Christopher Tiedman, Nathan Miller, Mark Reidenauer, Christopher Martin, and Hiram Diaz. They play on this album. They're playing on modern instruments, but it's brass music of the 19th century. They have both uh, Victor Ewald brass quintets, uh, which I believe were written for the instrumentation they use, which is cornets in alto horn, E flat alto horn, baritone instead of a trombone, and tuba which I think is what they were originally conceived for. And they also have the Oscar Bain Brass Sextet in E-flat major, which uh, is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, It's a great album. Uh, We hope you go give it a listen, and we'll have links in our show notes on where you can purchase it. And it's also obviously on our discography page on our website, along with a bunch of other albums of brass music from the 19th century. So you can check out the High Bridge Brass album or any other album over there on the discography page. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.